All right, now I think we're streaming. I think you can see me and hear me at this point. Um, uh, so I'm gonna say welcome back, or maybe you guys are telling me welcome back. We had a great time at Women of Valor last weekend. Um, just a, a beautiful time of fellowship. And I miss meeting with you guys, but I wish you could have all been there. It was, it was just, um, there's a sweetness, you know, uh, that seems there's more and more, I guess, as we, we follow this walk and more and more as when we go to a conference or a, a get together, a fellowship or whatever, more and more, it's more like a family reunion than a conference because you're seeing friends not old friends because they're not all old because we've got some young friends too but you see your you see your friends and so it's more like having like I said a family reunion and then you get to worship together on top of everything else and so uh, it really was a, a beautiful location um, haven't figured out yet how to pronounce it it was either Lake Junaluska or uh, Junaluska or something, but it was pretty. It was very pretty up there in the mountains. And uh, it's tempting to stay an extra day just to kind of enjoy the scenery and so forth. Um, but we came home. So uh, here we are this weekend uh, celebrating another Shabbat, celebrating another day of rest in the presence of the Father. And we know these, these Shabbats are not subtracted from our years because uh, they're eternal days. These are days that have eternal relevance. And so uh, what I'd like to do, first of all, I know normally I just um, kind of expect you to know the scriptural background and so forth. But what I'd like to do today, before we get too far along, is go ahead and I want to read some passages from this week's Torah portion. Because even though we're doing a Footsteps of Messiah series that's primarily concentrated on uh, passages in the, in the Song of Songs, uh, it seems like as we go along, I don't know if you guys have noticed it, that the Torah portions seem to be paralleling the topics that, that really I'm taking it from the Song of Songs, but it's as if there's some sort of divine timetable that we seem to be on. And um, so there's some beautiful things in the Torah portion this week that really reinforce the message about the principalities and powers that we're kind of unscheduled to study this week and next week and possibly next week. I know it'll be a part two. It depends on how fast I go today and next week as to whether there will be a part three. Um, but my plan is that we work through this information before the high holy days, because as you know, when we start blowing a shofar, we start, there's a disturbance. Uh, we start, uh, there's disruption in spiritual realms, because of course, the, the blow of the shofar, it has so many meanings. Uh, that's why I did that more than uh, program, which I don't know if it's aired yet, more than a horn. It's more than just a, a shofar. It's more than a horn. It's it's linking us uh, to the heavenly realms when we do that. And so as it, our awareness is raised during this time about what is our relationship to the spiritual realms and so forth, uh, I think it's a really good time, you know, um, not just to reinforce what we do know about principalities and powers, and what our relationship should or should not be uh, to them. This week's Torah portion definitely teaches us what it should not be. Um, but uh, having that awareness, I think, is important because in the book of Revelation, there are lots of people who are going to be deceived. That's the prophecy. Lots of people will be deceived by lying signs and wonders. And so if there are people who are doing blatantly wrong things, blatantly sinful things, those should be easy to identify. What's going to be harder to identify is people who appear as angels of light, uh, people who seem to talk like us, walk like us, think like us. And it's only after you walk with them for a while, or only if you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is written, will you be able to spot to, to be able to spot the deceiver? Okay, so that's that's where we want to spend some time. Uh, 
leading up, like I said, to the High Holy Days. And uh, then after that, of course, you know, we'll be on break for a little while because we're going on a, a Sukkot tour. We're going to get our feet in the land, Bezrat Hashem, for the Feast of Sukkot. And so uh, we'll be gone for two or three weeks from the live stream. But I know that you'll be busy in your camps, right? And so, so you don't need me on, on a live stream on Shabbat when you've got so much wonderful stuff planned, I'm sure, for Sukkot. So let's let's go ahead and read. Let me get rid of the baggage here. Let's go ahead and read. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see this. And I'll go ahead and start recording. Well, I already am recording. So surprise, surprise. I don't know what I'm doing. Here we go. All right, so here's our Torah portion, Shoftim, which is Judges. And I put on here the passages that I think are going to be important as it concerns not just the footsteps of Messiah, but how the footsteps of Messiah will actually begin shaking the powers and principalities in the heavenly places. And we call them heavenlies, but if it helps without getting too new agey or, you know, whatever, Think of them as realms, and realm is not a bad word. Um, I think realm, uh, if we say heavens, we tend to think of it in a linear fashion, like, okay, here's this one, this one, this, and they're stacked up on top of one another. In a sense, they kind of are, but realms don't work that way. So it's it's too limited to simply look at it as heaven stacked up on top of one another. Because when we're talking about something outside of our own realm, we're talking about something that we have not yet experienced. And so it, it may not be as linear uh, as we're imagining things. Um, so let's take a look at some of these passages. Let's start with Deuteronomy 16, 18. And we're going to link together the, the importance of having judges um, with kind of extending that, that principle of authority, divine authority, and seeing how it extends out into the heavenlies, because there are realms out there that we can't see. We don't necessarily experience them. Um, or if we do, it's we don't see that direct link. And often we'll go around blaming Satan on this and that. And as it turns out that uh, we're under the jurisdic jurisdiction of a principality or power. And actually what we're probably encountering sometimes is just the residue of living under that assigned principality or power that has been put in place by Adonai. Um, and, and we'll look at why do, they, why do they need to be there? Why did he need to put certain angels in charge of certain things like the Prince of Persia, especially if they seem to be as, a, you know, we want to be delicate here, but he was a little contrary when Daniel started praying. Let's unpack some of that. Let's find out why was the Prince of Persia so contrary? Um, does that mean that he was rebelling against God or does it maybe mean he was doing exactly what Adonai had assigned him to do? But once we learn the characteristics of angels and how they function, they're a little bit differently than mankind. We're, we're more multitaskers, even though we have limited ability, you know, to cross through these realms that the angels do at this time in our history. Nevertheless, they, they are I don't want to say programmed, but they were created to be a lot more single-minded than we are in terms of carrying out a mission or a message, a task. Um, and so often we have a hard time wrapping our minds around how they work because we can't really see them. Sometimes we just sense there's an obstacle in our way and we'll start casting out demons and devils and stuff. And actually that's just a, a divinely appointed being who might be obstructing you for a reason. It might be trying to redirect you. Um, you might be on the wrong path. And um, sometimes he takes us out in the wilderness to test us. And so the people we perceive as adversaries and enemies, Adonai brought us to that place to test us with those very people and, and situations. And so if we start running around, you know, casting out demons and stuff, it's, it's kind of foolish because he put that there to test you to see what your reaction would be. Um, we don't always know what the point of the obstacle is. At any rate, we're going to try to tie these things together because it has to do with heavenly authority. 
So Deuteronomy 1618, it says, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice, shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Sounds like very practical advice, but remember, the land that the Lord your God is giving you is not just the, the geographical boundaries of the land of Israel. That promise, going back to the time of Abraham, is a promise of resurrection and being restored to the Garden of Eden. And this is a place that not every human being in the Messianic kingdom will be privileged to live in, nor will they be privileged to pass back and forth between the natural realm and the Garden of Eden. So this is a necessary thing if, if we're going to prepare ourselves for that full inheritance. Because remember, we can't drag injustice into the Garden of Eden. We won't last any longer than Adam and Eve did. So we're practicing, we're rehearsing now. And part of this rehearsal is to appoint judges and officers. And they are supposed to judge with righteous judgment. Uh, let's go on to Deuteronomy 17.8. It says, if any case arises requiring a decision between one kind of homicide and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any case within your towns that is too difficult for you, then you shall arise and go up to the place that your Lord, your God will choose. All right? That arising phrase, that should make you think of a couple of things. Anytime you go to Jerusalem, you go up. From Jerusalem, everywhere else is down. Also, when you look at someone arising, you uh, want to think in terms of spiritual awakening or resurrection. So the promise here is that there will be a place where the Lord your God will choose, Jerusalem. And if there are difficult cases, then we are to resort to Jerusalem, which goes back to the passage in Deuteronomy 16, that you may live and inherit the land that your Lord your God is giving you not just the physical geographical land of Israel. In the Messianic kingdom, Jerusalem is going to be, there's going to be a marriage there between a, a spiritual and the natural realm. And the tribes of Israel are going to judge at the 12 gates of Jerusalem. And so out there in the nations, if there's difficult cases that will arise, they will go up to Jerusalem. And they will seek righteous judgment there from righteous judges. He says, you shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who is in office in those days. Those days. So there will be particular days in our history. You shall consult them and they shall declare to you the decision. Then you shall do according to what they declare to you from that place that the Lord will choose. See how he's pulling. Yeah, you're going to have local magistrates and so forth. But ultimately, he's prophetically preparing us during the kingdom of Messiah to go up to Jerusalem, where Messiah, Yeshua, will be king. And then, you know, if we qualify, we will rule and reign with him. If we rule and reign with him, that means that we will be restored to that original plan to be the judges of the nations. He says, you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you according to the instructions that they give you and according to the decision which they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the verdict that they declare to you, either to the right hand or to the left. The man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. You shall purge the evil from Israel and all the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again, All right? So that, that sounds pretty stiff, pretty stiff penalties for not listening to a judge. And so many times we reject a human judge and say, oh, they make mistakes. Well, of course they do. They're human judges. But you are preparing, you are rehearsing now with human judges, because if you can't submit to an authority right now that you can see, then imagine in the kingdom where you know you've excused obedience because you said this was an imperfect judge 
And so you have acquired a habit of rebellion and doing your own thing and acting presumptuously as it's translated. And so now it's, it, the penalty level goes way up. You'll die if you don't do what they say to do. If, if they're advising on a certain matter and you don't do it, you die. Dying is separation. Um, so you want to practice like you intend uh, the reality to be. All right. So let's look at this one. Deuteronomy 18.9. And again, it goes back, just taking us back to the land of Israel. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, or anyone who practices divination, or tells fortunes, or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Right. So if you've ever dabbled in that or if you are dabbling in that, if you're reading your horoscope, if you're reading astrology books, um, you know, if, if you're into some sort of mysticism from the East, then you need to forego that right now. You just need to make up your mind right now. Whatever I, the beauty that I see in that is deceitful. Let me drop that and let me turn back to the Torah. He says, because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for these nations, which you are about to dispossess. Listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Right Now, it doesn't mean that he's saying it's okay for the nations to do it. He's just saying they're doing it. And they're doing it, as we're going to talk about in the lesson today, the reason that they're doing it is because of a fundamental misunderstanding of principalities and powers and um, the practice of idolatry. Often we're practicing idolatry and we don't realize it. But in the end, idolatry is following your own self-will as opposed to, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The Father's will be done. When we don't agree with the will of the Father, then we try to figure out a way to pursue our own will. And so an, a misunderstanding of the role of these principalities of powers caused the nations to turn to them as sources of power, which they do have. They do have some or they would be turning to them. But it's appointed power. It's appointed authority. And they are created beings. Uh, I think I used the example in the newsletter. It's like, you know, if mom and dad won't give a child a particular toy or something that he wants, he says, well, okay, mom and dad don't want me to have it, but that doesn't mean I can't have it. So he goes to the next door neighbor and says, hey, you know, may I have this or may I borrow this or whatever it is mom and dad told him he couldn't have. Well, he'll go to a stranger and ask for this thing from a stranger because does the stranger have the power to give the child the object or the toy or whatever or the, the privilege? Yeah, but that's not their child. And so he's saying this is the difference between Israel's relationship uh, that you can look at the nations and see the mistakes that they've made rather than go directly to their creator and submit their will to him, they will go to his appointed beings and try to tap into their power because they do have an interest in the principality that they are set over. But you can see the twisting there. He says, Israel, you especially, you need to look at this and, and say, this is not, never going to happen with us because our Elohim looks after us personally. Uh, he looks over the land of Israel personally. He looks over his people personally. He doesn't allow these principalities and powers to babysit them, so to speak. I'm not going to send them to the neighbors for babysitting. He's, his eyes are constantly over his land. And if you were his in covenant, then his eyes are constantly upon you. He's not going to leave you in the care of another. And because of that special privilege 
that you have, you also have a special obligation to avoid turning to these principalities and powers who are not your parents. They're not your father. And yes, do they have power? Can they cause a little bit of trouble in your life? Yes, but only that which they are permitted and authorized by your father to do. They can't go outside of that. There is a hedge of protection around you. And so if you're meeting obstacles, adversaries, you know, it seems like there's enemies and so forth. If you were serving him, there's, there's, they can only go as far as he tells them they are permitted to do. And that's why we have to be careful of reviling angelic majesties because they might be doing what they were told to do. And in reviling the, the angelic majesty, you might actually be reviling the one who sent that angelic majesty to put that obstacle in your place to test you to see what was in your heart. And I know that's a big responsibility for us, but it goes with the title, Israel. It, it goes with the territory, so to speak, because this territory is not like the territory of the nations. You are his personal, chosen, precious possession. Okay, this one is not from the Haftar portion this week, but I, I think it uh, illustrates what we're trying to say, that the way we prepare today, learning the word, uh, learning to rightly divide the word, it's preparing us if what Isaiah is about to tell us about the kingdom of Messiah, when this prophecy is fulfilled, then we will need those skills. We will need to be able to hear a case, we'll need to be able to hear a dispute, hear a question uh, that somebody from the nations might bring to us, to Jerusalem, uh, or maybe he'll even send us out to that place. Who knows how all that's going to work? Because we know the Torah is going to go forth from Jerusalem. It could be that some people are actually sent out rather than the people coming up. But we know the hard cases will come up. The, the difficult ones won't stay out in the nations at that time. We need to have an answer because we have studied and uh, committed ourselves to the word and being a kingdom of priests and judges as it was established in the wilderness during the time of Moses. So here's what Isaiah 2, 2 through 6 says. And just as you're reading this, Envision that time in the Messianic kingdom where the 12 tribes of Israel will be judging from Jerusalem. It says, now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Remember on your, your prophecy glossary, mountains can represent nations. Mountains can represent nations. So add that to your glossary if you've started one. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and the nations will stream to it. So you can even see within the same sentence, it's affirming what the mountain is. Um, the mountain of the house of Adonai is going to be raised above the, the nations and the nations will stream to it. They will go up to Jerusalem for judgment. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth, the law will go forth from Zion, the Torah will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. Come, house of Jacob, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. The Torah is a light, the commandment is a lamp. For you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with influences from the east, and they are soothsayers like the Philistines. And they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. So it sounded all lovely starting out. Oh, yeah, we're going to be judges in Jerusalem and, and peoples are going to come up and King Messiah is going to reign and to rule. And uh, we're going to help him to render decisions for many peoples. But he's saying, you know what? You can miss this, this privilege. It doesn't mean there's not 
room for you. It just means that you can't be trusted as a judge. You're, you're not going to basically be uh, elected <laughs> to, to the judge uh, position. Because why? You abandon your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with influences from the east. They're soothsayers. So he's saying, if we are holding to sorcery, if we are resorting to the principalities and powers of the nations, then he's just abandoning us. Um, because rather than realizing who we were as a precious people, um, rather than being able to pray like Yeshua, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, we have not prepared ourselves for that position. There's nothing really on our resume except under pressure, I buckled. Under pressure, I tried to find a different way to get my way. If Adonai wouldn't let me have my way, I would go and I would find some principality or power who would. Um, and in our generation, we don't necessarily turn to, you know, little gods and goddesses that we might have in our house. Um, it doesn't mean that, that we're not turning to um, some of the Eastern arts and mysticism. It doesn't mean that uh, we're replacing the word with uh, meditation and all sorts of things. There's hardly anything you can do nowadays. I mean, even your, your insurance company is trying to force yoga on you and meditation and all this stuff. But uh, it's scriptural. We pray. You know, we meditate upon the word. Every good thing he's given us in his word. Why in the world would we turn to the influences from the East? Um, because often if we meditate, upon his word and we pray his word, it's gonna bring about a change in us. It's gonna be difficult. Whereas the Eastern is basically going to uh, make you feel at peace with yourself when it's part of yourself that the Holy Spirit's trying to get rid of. <laughs> there's, there's some part of you that you've adopted into your life. He's like, no, you need to just send that child on. I mean, you struck a, a bargain with a foreigner, all right? Get rid of that part of who you are. It's not consistent with who you are as a king, a priest, a holy nation, right? So that was just our preface. I thought this week it was important for us uh, to do the, the warm-up work here um, of reading through the, the context of the scriptures. I mean, word, word for word, instead of just kind of referring to them and expecting that you have already read the Torah portion where maybe you're not. I don't know what time zone you're in. Uh, so like I say, I want to, this is footsteps of Messiah and our focus this week and next week and possibly the next is to see how these footsteps of Messiah are beginning to uh, shake principalities and powers in high places. And so if they are shaking principalities and powers in high places, I think it's important for us to know how those things function. Because we can make mistakes. Like I said, we can go around arguing with the devil and casting stuff out that, you know, Adam and I put there. <laughs> On the other hand, there might be a time when we need to take authority over something, but we need to discern what authority we do have. Um, if we sense that we're dealing with something that has crossed into a realm that is not assigned to it, it's this is our realm, you need to get out of it. Um, you know, the creator. He established our realm. And if you're from another realm, you got to go. All right. You're not assigned here. And, and you clearly know that from scripture. You may have to speak into that situation. So the more we understand about that realm without just becoming fascinated and improperly crossing into it, uh, I think the better we're going to be prepared to avoid the mistake and revelation where many are going to worship the image of the beast because they're going to be deceived he is going to look like he has power. He's going to look like a miracle worker and a wonder worker. We have to know the difference. And so that's hopefully what we're accomplishing here is we're acquiring a competence in understanding the principalities and powers and understand that they are just divinely created, appointed beings. They have their things to do and we have our things to do. But if we don't know the word inside and out, we're about to head into a tough time during the footsteps of Messiah 
because all this stuff has to be shaken up and brought down in order for Israel to rise up and take their place in Jerusalem and begin to judge the nations as it was originally uh, planned rather than having to put these other entities into place because Israel would not do her job. Okay, so this is part one. And we'll start with another scripture here. This is Ephesians 6, 11 through 13. And I know you all know this one, but in light of what we just read in the Torah portion, let's read it. Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the adversary, the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, other realms. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to res resist on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Right? And you notice I put a big X over the Roman uh, armor, the Roman helmet, the Roman uh, armor things that they put on their breastplate and all that. I put a big X over it because when we read that passage, if, if we keep reading it, it talks about the helmet of salvation and so forth. We tend to envision our, our heavenly authority and our heavenly protection as somehow dressed up like a Roman soldier. And I'm sure Paul did that for a reason as a contrast. But instead of contrasting, sometimes we tend to conflate and put the two things together. By no means should you ever put on Roman armor. And by Roman armor, we mean Esau's armor. Uh, remember, Rome is called the red one, like Esau. He's Edom. And so the last thing we want is to wear this earthly materialistic armor. Instead, we need spiritual armor because we're not battling against flesh and blood. We need to see that better as a contrast. Um, your, your problem is not in the physical world. It feels very much like the problem's coming from the physical world, but the problem's actually coming from the spiritual world, principalities and powers, world forces of darkness. Uh, and how sometimes their agendas are at cross purposes and you might be standing in the way of their agenda. See, and if we know the characteristics of angels, then it helps us to understand why uh, an angel might cause you a problem. Just like with Daniel, um, the Prince of Persia was an appointed prince over an empire, but he was causing Daniel a problem when Daniel prayed and so we'll, over the next week or two, we'll, we'll break that down and say, well, why was that happening? Why was that allowed to happen? Well, it's because the, the created nature of angels, they work a little bit differently. All right. So, uh, well, we won't go there. Either. Let's just kind of back up a little bit, because I think there's something back here in Ephesians that will tell us a little bit more about what it means to prevail or to win the battle. He says, um, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to res resist on the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. Mm -hmm. This is how you win the battle. Uh, there's a great song out right now. This is how I fight my battles. Um, how do you fight your battles? Because if we think of Jacob wrestling with the angel all night, often we have in the back of our minds that like it was some sort of jujitsu match. You know, they were doing judo or something, <laughs> MMA, you know, <laughs> they were slugging one another. That's not how you fight an angel. Uh, remember, it's, a, it's something from another realm. At first, he's called a man and he's perceived as a human being, apparently at the beginning of the, the battle. But then... Jacob realizes, wait a minute, no, this is an angel. This is coming from another realm. And so obviously it wasn't a wrestling match the way we would think of it. How do you prevail in a battle like that? How do you go from Jacob to Israel? You stand. 
you don't give up. That's how you prevail. You just stand firm. And that's exactly what we have to do. I mean, and so often we feel like we're in a battle and I should be doing something because every day I get up and it feels like the adversary has thrown a new dart. It feels like the adversary has launched a new arrow or the adversary is launching multiple arrows at one time on one day. You know, uh, I've joked before that I think all your appliances and cars, they have a meeting one night and they just kind of divvy it up and say, okay, who's going to break down on what day this week? Because it just seems it clusters up like that, doesn't it? Uh, I don't think, I don't actually think that they have a meeting. They probably just send memos to each other. But at any rate, it, it feels as though um, everything's beyond your control. Like all of a sudden the world's turned against you. The appliances are turned against you. The car's turned against you. Your boss is turned against you. Your coworkers are turned against you. Your children are turned against you. What's going on there? Yeah, you are in a battle, but remember, you're just looking at the human face of it or the appliance face of it. But appliances are from a fallen world like we are and they just break down, right? Um, with human beings, sometimes there's things going on that you're not aware of and you don't have to be aware of them. That's the great thing. You don't have to try to figure out why they're acting like that. Um, and now, if it would be useful in terms of a conflict resolution, sure. But sometimes you just know you're under attack. It's not a time for negotiation. And you feel like you should take up a sword and start hitting back. And in fact, Paul's saying, stand there. You just stand there. You have every piece of spiritual equipment you need, and you just stand there and you may not feel like it. You may not think like it, but what's actually happening if, if you will just stand there and refuse to budge from your place, eventually you will realize that the heavens are fighting for you. Just like Daniel found out, you know, Gabriel is trying to get the message through. It took Michael to help him get the message through. The, the heavenly forces will begin to move into place to protect you. So how are you fighting that battle? Are you using ugly words back? Are you sabotaging? You know, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing anything other than using these tools that Paul was talking about, you know, the helmet of salvation, your faith, the sword of the word. These are the sorts of things. You don't do things back in the natural world necessarily. Now, if you're under a physical attack, sure, defend yourself. But we're talking about, you know, different kind of battle here. And so you hold your place. And keep telling yourself, it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't sound like it. But actually, there are heavenly forces on my side. And they are fighting this battle in a way that I can't by fighting back in the natural realm. I am fighting this battle in a spiritual realm by just standing firm on my conviction, standing firm on my faith. If I will stand right there, this situation really isn't beyond my control. The deceiver wants to tell me it's beyond my control. It's not beyond your control. You just stand confidently in your salvation, if that makes sense. All right, so let's, let's move on from there. And let's go back to numbers. Numbers 24, 5, and 6. And this is a case where Israel didn't know they were already in a battle. Do you remember this? When uh, Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel. And Israel's just out there camping in the wilderness, you know, having a good time out in the wilderness and, and getting along <laughs> temporarily. Uh, it's all good. You know, they're just enjoying the wilderness and... Uh, doing whatever they did for 40 years in the wilderness. And they don't realize it, but there's principalities and powers out there attacking them through human beings. Yes, through a sorcerer. Well, actually two sorcerers. Uh, Balak was a different kind and 
you can go back in our archives and find a, a kind of an analysis of the two different kinds of sorcerers that Balak and Balaam were. But they have human beings who are acting, um, again, principalities and powers are behind this because they are sorcerers. However, in spite of two sorcerers ganging up on Israel without their knowledge, you have to wonder, did they feel anything when Balak and Balaam were out there building their altars and trying to curse and do all that? Sometimes we're just oblivious and maybe that's the best thing, uh, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't always be on our guard. And so Balaam realizes he cannot curse Israel. He can't do it. Every time he opens his mouth, something good comes out, a blessing comes out. And so we're all familiar with this one. How pleasant are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Makes you think of the Garden of Eden. Gardens beside a river, there were rivers in Eden. And so Bilam is forced to see Israel in their inheritance, risen up into the Garden of Eden, risen up to that place where they were going to judge the nations, risen up to that place where they can pass between the natural and the spiritual worlds like Yeshua. And all he can say is, wow, how pretty that is, <laughs> how pleasant that is. I, he says, I hope my end is like theirs, which it won't be. Because um, he's a sorcerer. He tried to um, blur the lines on the assigned realms. Uh, but in that same passage, that very same passage, we have this. We have, for there is no divination in Jacob. There is no divination in Jacob. Remember, this is the content of the Torah portion. You're not supposed to be practicing divination. And so Balak and Balaam, they're blessing Israel, and they're being forced to say the words that accuse them, that basically are their adversary, their devil. For there is no divination in Jacob. At the very time it's coming out of his mouth, Bilam has to realize he is a diviner. Well, Balak was a diviner. Bilam was a sorcerer. <laughs> uh, professionals. But there is no divination in Jacob. How did they attain to that place of the garden with the rivers running through it? How did they attain to that place of Jerusalem? Well, they attained to that place, again, because there was no divination. There was no blurring the lines. And so within that, that, that next verse in that passage, there is no divination in Jacob. Behold, the people will arise like a lion cub and raise itself like a lion. It will not lie down until it consumes its prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Now, this is not literal by the way, <laughs> they're not literally going to drink anybody's blood. It's a, it's a metaphoric expression. But when there is no divination in Jacob, when that, that divination of self-will and power seeking, when that is no longer found in Jacob, then it's going to rise up like a lion cup, like a lion. They are going to be like their King Messiah. And therefore, they will be able to rule and reign with him. You know, the lion might be the king of the jungle, but Yeshua is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. How will we reign with the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Then we will study this Torah portion about the judges. We will learn what is required to remove divination from our midst. Uh, so... This ultimate battle of the ages, it's going to be won by warriors who are not using divination for the fight. What are they doing? When they are fighting in their appointed realm, when they are fighting in their appointed calling, they stand. They stand. When you stand, you fight like a lion. 
because that's all you have to do is let the lion of the tribe of Judah fight for you. And that's kind of the deal. He's, he's obligated himself to do it. If you will obligate yourself to stay away from divination, if you will obligate yourself to prepare yourself in the word with it is written, then he will fulfill his obligation. You know, the adversary might be going around as a roaring lion, but he ain't no lion like the lion of Judah. There's a difference and we will be like him. Uh, so going back to a previous newsletter, if you get our newsletter, that's that's great. If you don't get the newsletter, if you don't need another email in your box, you can always go to our website, www.thecreationgospel.com and go to our archives. And that's updated about once a month. Uh, but especially with the footstep series, I thought for some people it might be beneficial just to print out the newsletter rather than depend on, on the live stream because there's some things that often I'll leave it out in the live stream. Um, and it might be that the, the written, the newsletter will help fill in some of those gaps for you. And it gives you more time, I think, to read through the, you know, the, the scripture passages as well, and kind of sort through your thoughts. Um, but in a previous newsletter we did, which was called the dust of Jacob, we took an in-depth look at this all night wrestling match, which remember, it's just Basically, just stand on your convictions, stand on your faith. Jacob had this all-night battle with Esau's angel. Um, and that's, the, of course, the Jewish viewpoint. Could there be another viewpoint? Sure, there could. We don't want to argue that. But let's just say this viewpoint is accurate, that somehow Jacob was wrestling all night with Esau's guardian angel. And... Um, in that particular newsletter, we took a look at how delicate the relationship is when we're talking about how human beings and other created beings interact or shouldn't interact. And these other created beings, we usually refer to them as angels or in Hebrew, malachim, malachim. Uh, what is a malachim? Now, it might go by different names, too, in scripture. Um, an angel or a malach might be referred to as an Elohim, which also means a judge, like not with the big E, with the small E. Um, and that's, you know, Yeshua got into a hermeneutics discussion uh, with the Judeans at Hanukkah in the Gospel of John. And he says, you're not applying the, the hermeneutics right here because Elohim Elohim can mean Elohim, the creator, big E. Elohim can also mean uh, small E, judges, angels, other created beings, magistrates, and so forth. Um, at any rate, uh, when we improperly interact with those created but appointed beings. Remember, they have their assigned authority. They have their assigned job. You know, and we might be running up against a principality or power in some instances, and, and maybe just say, just doing my job, just doing my job. And you're like, well, that's not helping me. Just doing my job. Better pray because <laughs> I'm doing my job. Because if we will pray, then that can be overridden like we see in the case of Daniel and the Prince of Persia and, and Michael and Gabriel. Um, but these beings, they each have a strictly assigned realm of operation. And we're told very clearly, just like we read in Torah portion and Shokhtim, we're not supposed to cross these boundaries because if we cross those boundaries, number one, we're, we're stepping into idolatry because idolatry is going to happen the moment you do something he told you not to do. You knew he told you not to do it, and you did it anyway. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. There's an equivalency there. So you have your assigned realm. Stay in it. That's why if, if you're dealing with things, if you're 100% sure you're correct, and you need to invoke the authority, the name of Yeshua, that's what you do. But it kind of goes back to like when they were contending for the body of Moses, the angel says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The angel won't even directly rebuke. 
an adversarial being. This adversarial being might have been dispatched to take Moses' body back um, or his, his soul to the realm of death. But uh, the angel, this angel might have been assigned to take him to Abraham's bosom. So there's a conflict here. Does the angel wield his own authority and power or does he invoke the authority and power of the one who sent him on this message and say, hey, look, I know you know you normally take possession of a soul from a body, but this is coming from the throne itself and, and it's overriding. So he says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Um, you're, you're functioning as an adversary and, and you have to submit to the throne. Uh, but if we improperly interact with those beings, we can get ourselves into a lot of trouble. Um, often you run into people who want to communicate with someone in another realm, especially you know the realm of the dead, which came up in the Torah portion, or they want to tap into the energy of another realm. Is there a, a knowledge out there in those other realms? Sure. They know things we don't know. Uh, However, it doesn't mean that you have permission to tap into that realm in order to acquire some secret knowledge or some special knowledge like Simon the Sorcerer. And he's like, sell me this power. I want this power. Why? Because it, again, was for self-exaltation, self-promotion. And when we're tapping into those realms, number one, it's idolatry and rebellion. And number two, it's pride because we wanna lift ourselves up above someone else and wield power over them. And so as, if we're trying to tap into those realms, then we're falling into the area of sorcery and divination. That's strictly prohibited in scripture and there is no wiggle room on that, none. If the father wants to take you into another realm, he will take you into another realm. But you're not supposed to be learning incantations, secret arts, meditations, and blah, blah, blah from the children of the East. No, you don't do that. That's rebellion. That's idolatry. Uh, kind of going back to the dust of Jacob, uh, that particular lesson there, the, remember there was the rabbinic viewpoint that the angel that, that Jacob struggled with all night was Esau's angel. Why? Why did he persist in asking for a blessing? Why did he say, I'm not going to let you go? Well, <laughs> probably the angel wouldn't have had any problem disengaging, but again, it's a spiritual battle. So you don't fight it the same. You stand firm, you stand stubbornly on your faith and on this particular point, Jacob stood firm. I want your blessing. Bless me first. Why does he need that? Remember, he's tricked his father. He, he posed as Esau and tricked his father into giving him a blessing. Now, did he legitimately trade for the birthright? Sure. Esau gave it up for something material, something to eat. But as it concerned the blessing, which allows you to basically execute the birthright. It was through trickery, trickery, trickery. And so what does Jacob want here? If this is Esau's angel, remember he's not struggling against Esau. He's struggling against principalities and powers in high places. And so as Esau has elected to tap into the energy of this other realm in order to exalt himself in the, the physical natural world. Jacob might look at his brother as the adversary, but it's actually his brother has tapped into this. And so he, he says, okay, you came to me. I didn't go to you. You came into my realm. I'm not going to stop standing on this until you give me a blessing because he wants it legitimately. He doesn't want it through deceit. And if he's going to get the blessing to go with the birthright, he got it from his father, but Esau needs to release it. And is it Esau who needs to release it or is it Esau's angel? If that's the pattern, then Esau's angel 
could release that blessing. Why? Because Esau has placed himself under the control of that realm, principalities and powers and high places. And so uh, he says, I want you to bless me. I want you to release that blessing. My father gave it to me. I want you to release it so that it's rightfully mine. I want you to relinquish it. Just like the Prince of Persia, he had to relinquish to Gabriel and to Michael the prophecy to be able to carry the prophecy uh, and the message through to Daniel in answer to his prayer. Um, and in fact, the next day, when Jacob meets Esau face to face, uh, what does he say to Esau? He says, for I see your face as one sees the face of God or Elohim. And you have received me favorably. Uh, and that's the question. See, in Hebrew, you don't have capital letters and small letters. You have barely a gap between words. Uh, you don't have these vowels in the original text. And so you're kind of left to the context to figure out, is he talking about the face of Elohim, the creator? Or is he saying your face is like the face of Elohim, your angel that I fought with all night long? Because it's said that your, your guardian angel resembles you somehow. Or maybe you resemble the angel. I don't know how that works exactly. But that's, that's kind of something that's been passed down uh, in Jewish tradition, that your guardian angel has your appearance in some ways. And so this is what Jacob says to Esau. I see your face like the face of Elohim. And you've received me favorably. It's like Jacob is saying, hey, it worked. You know, I wouldn't let go of your guardian angel until he legitimately released me the blessing. And what's just happened? Esau accepted all these natural material gifts of wealth from Jacob. Remember the, the sheep and the donkeys and the camels and the, the goats and, and all this, the, the cows, the cattle that Jacob sent ahead to Esau. He said, why is he sending that stuff to Esau? If it all belongs to him, if he gets the blessing, then why is he sending it to Esau? Remember, Esau, he made a bargain for natural material wealth. Jacob was bargaining for spiritual wealth. And so he, he you know, asked the Esau's angel to bless him. Okay, you're blessed. And now your name is going to change from Jacob to Israel because it changes your whole future. It changes everything for your descendants. It really opens the way to resurrection. It, it takes this promise of resurrection one step farther because now your sons will be the 12 tribes of Israel. Your sons, your, your 12 tribes will be those who judge from the 12 gates of Jerusalem and it will be part of the restoration of the earth and going back to the original plan in the garden. And so when Jacob says, I see your face like the face of Elohim, and you have received me favorably, it's like, wow, you know, your angel did really look like you. And guess what? You took my gifts. So it sealed the deal. I now have the birthright and the blessing that's going to enable my descendants, the 12 tribes, to arise from the dead, to resurrect from the dead. And of course, from the tribe of Judah is going to come the line of Messiah, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so that's just, I mean, you don't have to accept that. That's one way of looking at those passages, especially since we know that, you know, we're told that we can't see the face of God and live. Um, why would Jacob say something like this? Unless it, it does have something to do with, again, the principalities and powers in high places that we're struggling against when we think we're struggling against a human being. And so Jacob's like, hey, it worked. You know, you took you took the gifts that I sent to you to seal the deal. And it's, and it's a favorable thing. You're not trying to kill me. Um, but the, the wealth to Jacob, the blessing of the wealth of Jacob is something that would be realized thousands of years later. Not that his descendants haven't prospered. Many of them have. But the true wealth of Israel, the true blessing, it's only going to be revealed during the reign of Messiah. And so at the resurrection, 
when we are resurrected with Messiah, that's when we're truly going to see the force of the blessing that was transacted right here in the meeting between Jacob and Esau. Uh, it makes sense though, and, and we're not gonna take the time to read this again. I think we've read it before together and it's John 10, 22 through 38. And if we haven't read it together, please go back and read it. Uh, remember this is a, um, we did a little Becky book on this called The Seven Shepherds uh, a book kind of going back to the prophecies of Hanukkah, uh, not just in the book of Haggai, but also from the Torah itself. Most people don't realize the hints that are there, but in that little book, we kind of go through, why would Yeshua have been in the temple at the Feast of Dedication? Why would he have had this particular interaction if he were walking in the temple at, at Hanukkah? Well, there's a, a reason. The expectation of the seventh shepherd and the eighth prince at that time and so they're asking him, are you the Messiah? Are you the seventh shepherd? Are you the eighth prince? And he starts talking about sheep. And so the, the connection was clearly there with the seven, seventh shepherd. Uh, but there's an extra layer to this, not just the prophecies uh, that we covered in seven shepherd, shepherds, but it also go, goes back to this particular incident with Jacob and the angel who wrestled all night. Uh, because remember, when Yeshua was asked, are you the Messiah or not? Tell us plainly. They were asking, are you the authentic one? Because there's been lots of Messiahs up to this point. There were lots of Messiahs after this point. And many people followed false Messiahs. And they say, tell us, are you authentic or not? And all of a sudden, Yeshua starts giving a sheep speech. I'm like, sheep speech? Why are you talking about sheep, Yeshua? Well, there's so much prophecy about sheep anyway. Uh, but there's a tradition behind this wrestling match between uh, the angel and Jacob. And part of it is that initially when the angel appeared to Jacob and he thought he was a human being, he appeared as a shepherd robber, a shepherd robber, um, actually a robber chief. and. Uh, they say that Jacob had sheep, but so did this angel. This angel had sheep with him too. And so when the angel appears at the stream with his sheep, they say the angel says something to Jacob like, okay, bring across the stream what is mine and I'll bring across what is yours. And they say the angel brought across Jacob's flock in the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye, he brings Jacob's flock across. Is this authentic? Is this based on truth? Or is this a sorcery? That's the question. Now, if we think of the blink of an eye, that instantly makes us think of um, how Yeshua talks about eternal life. You know, my sheep know my voice. They will not follow another. I'm going to give them eternal life. Uh, it makes you think of the resurrection and Messiah Yeshua. Uh, also makes you think of the Feast of Trumpets, when we will be transformed in the blink of an eye. Well, Yeshua is the good shepherd. He's the seventh shepherd. He's the eighth prince. He's going to protect the father's sheep so that they can re-enter the Garden of Eden, so that, you know, that heritage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can be passed along to the 12 tribes. But there's also imposters, just like we're told in Revelation. There are sorcerers. Um, and what these sorcerers attempt to do is to blur the lines of obedience that are drawn around the Garden of Eden and fire. You know, fiery swords. You, you don't get in there in, in, in disobedience. But nevertheless, there's a belief out there. There are imposters out there who are teaching the people of Adonai that it's okay to set your own rules um, and that you're going to be able to function just fine in the garden. You're going to live this wonderful resurrected life. Um, but you don't have to be, you know, obedient. Yeshua died so that you wouldn't have to be. Somehow Yeshua's grace makes your rebellion invisible. <laughs> 
<laughs> but think about it. Are we really going to be resurrected in the blink of an eye and restored to the garden if we're in a state of rebellion against the voice of Elohim that walked in the garden? If we're in a state of rebellion against the living word, do we really think we're going to be resurrected in the blink of an eye at the first resurrection? Or do we think maybe there might be that second resurrection where there's an accounting that has to be given for why we thought we could trample underfoot the blood of Messiah? Because there's a judgment there too. We want to be in the first resurrection. But the thing is, yes, we do need Messiah's righteousness to live there. But we don't use his death as an excuse to keep living rebelliously. And if there are people out there who are telling us it's okay, it's all under grace, you can do anything you want to, but you're you're still saved and you're going to go in the blink of an eye, that's likely to be a work of sorcery. They're blurring the lines. You know, they don't have to pull a rabbit out of the hat to be a sorcerer just blurring the lines where you think you're seeing something, but they're actually what they're doing is they're concealing the truth with a lie. You think you're seeing life, but actually they're teaching you how to excuse death in your life. And so Yeshua says, you know, my sheep won't follow another. No, they can't be led astray. They're not going to be led into immoral disobedient behavior um, because they want to be welcomed into the garden. If they transgress, they'll repent because they're following my voice. They know my voice. Nobody's going to snatch them out of my hand. My sheep know how to repent because as they're studying and as they're learning the word, as they're learning what pleases the father, then they will be transformed by that word. They won't be stubbornly you know, digging in with their heels and saying, hey, I'm not about to change this sin. And, and so often it, it really disturbs me if I hear somebody say, well, that's just the way I am. I'm just an unforgiving person. You mess me up one time. I'm never going to forget. I'm like, who gave you permission not to forgive? Right. My little secret sin over here. I can get it. No, I don't think you can. If you know it's a sin, I don't see how you can keep getting away with it. It might mean you have to repent of it 20 times until that transformation is fully done. You repent of it 20 times if that's what it takes. That's what Yeshua died for so that we wouldn't give up, so that we would stand, stand on our faith. I might know it's wrong. I fell into it again. But you know what? Tomorrow's a new day. I'm going to repent. Holy Spirit, help me to overcome this. I want to be an overcomer. I don't want to begin excusing my sin just because I don't want to deal with it. Or I think I'm entitled to my sin. I might think I'm entitled to be a gossip. No, you're not. You need to practice stopping gossiping. Uh, that's the voice of Esau is the sorcerer. He's the red one. He's the red beast. Um, and the beast, if you'll remember, is the messenger of the adversary, the messenger of the serpent and revelation. So kind of going back to um, the Midrash story about Jacob and the angel, the Midrash uh, tells how Jacob keeps going back and forth across the stream. And, you know, he's going to get these sheep. And it's like, well, I thought I got all the sheep. There's more sheep here. And he brings the sheep across and he goes back and there's more sheep there. And he brings. And finally, as, as it gets close to the dawn, they say, Jacob realized. This is sorcery. And they say, he's like, sorcery, sorcery, you're a sorcerer, for sorcerers are successful at night. And remember, in your prophecy glossary, night can represent the exile. So is there a lot of sorcery going on in the night of exile in the house of Israel? You betcha. There's a lot of sorcery. But it, it finally dawns on him, wait a minute, my sheep know my voice. My voice is the only voice they've ever followed. My sheep know my voice. They're not going to follow someone else. If they hear me, they will follow me across this, this stream. My sheep were with me from the beginning. These are Esau's sheep. And so um, when he realizes this is just an illusion, um, Yeshua's sheep know his voice. They're not going to follow another. 
But there will be other sheep out there that are Esau's sheep. They belong to the red one. And we'll work ourselves silly sometimes trying to gather up Esau's sheep. When their point is just to keep you busy, <laughs> to keep you in the battle, when really Jacob could have just stood there all night. He had his sheep with him. He had his sheep. Um, and that's what Yeshua said. My sheep won't follow another. And it finally dawns, there's a pun, uh, on Jacob that these are my sheep. These are Esau's. And so once he discovers the sorcery, uh, the angel knows the dawn is breaking. The day is breaking. He says, I have to go. Why does he have to go at the dawn? Because remember, dawn signals the end of the exile. And the dawn of the day represents, if you're working on your prophecy glossary, the day represents Israel dwelling in obedience with the Father. It's a time of, like King Solomon, perfect peace. There's peace between human beings. There's peace between human beings and the Holy One. And so the angel knows his time is short. That should sound familiar. He knows his time is short. He knows he has to go. And then Jacob's like, bless me before you go. Um, but because Esau is the red one, he's called the red one in Judaism. And then you can see that also in the book of Revelation that he's the red beast or the, the serpent is also red, by the way. Um, if that interests you, then you should try workbook four, the creation gospel, which is the scarlet harlot and the crimson thread. We trace that all the way from Genesis to Revelation. But there's a codependency between the beast and the serpent. Um, the beast derives his authority from the serpent. They both know their time is short when the dawn breaks. The exile of Israel is almost over when it's time for the dawn. And at that point, Esau knows that his mountain is about to be judged. Remember what we read right up front? Esau knows his mountain is about to be judged by the house of Israel. And so when they know their time is short, obviously there's going to be a lot of shaking and struggling and so forth. That might be the most vicious part of the battle. But you hang on. You stand right there because Jacob's sheep are going to be the faithful ones that stood and they were not moved. They knew the voice of their Messiah. They knew the word of Adonai. But Esau's sheep will finally be identified as the, the products of sorcery. They are the, the disrespecters of heavenly boundaries of authority. And this is why with the judges, they teach us boundaries of authority. Uh, somebody said less talking last night about the Torah portion with some folks and uh, something they read said, you know what? Human judges are fallible. They can be wrong sometimes. But the idea in the Torah is that um, because remember, there's a, a sacrifice for leaders, judges that lead people astray by accident. They thought they were doing the right thing and they, they actually taught people to do the wrong thing. So there's a sacrifice. There's an acknowledgement that human beings are fallible. They're going to make some mistakes. But because these judges are appointed because of their expertise, because of their character, because of their righteousness, because of their wisdom and their understanding and their, their experience in the word, yeah, they're going to make some mistakes. But they say it's better to make one mistake under the authority of a good judge than to throw off your judges and make tons of mistakes. Because of their wisdom, there are tons of mistakes we won't make. As human beings, we tend to focus on the one mistake a human being does make. And that makes a whole lot of sense. You know, why was that sacrifice included? There's an acknowledgement. They're going to make some mistakes. Follow them anyway. Follow them anyway. Um, and um, you know, unless you know you're dealing with a wicked judge that just repeatedly defies the authority of the word, it, it might not feel good, might not feel right, because we, I know I'm right, I know I'm right, I know I'm right. You might be, but see, you probably thought you were right 10 years ago, and it turned out you were wrong about something. 
Well, you might be 100% sure you're right about something today. And everybody's telling you, no, 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 that's not the right way. But I know I'm right. I know I'm right. I'm going to hang on. I know I'm right. And then five years from now, if we ask you, like, you're not going to be that sure you were right. And, and this is how judges help us. And those instances where we're convinced we're right, but wisdom is telling us, no, that's not right. And if you want to be in a community, you can't insist on your rightness and that respect. Uh, it's not standing up to the word. Um, it, it, it's a way of, of pulling a community together where there's going to be at least once in every life, if not multiple times, where we think we're right and the whole world is wrong. And that, that kind of is like a little safeguard for those particular times. And this is why it's important that as created creatures, that we maintain our boundaries. And, you know, as these principalities and powers, they have boundaries. It's important that we do too, that we maintain not just our boundaries, but our authority within those boundaries, that we exercise our authority within those boundaries. Um, so we don't want to violate someone else's appointed place or time, but we don't want someone else messing with our appointed place and time. So that's why we're looking into this. Are we going to know if somebody is, is wrongfully transgressing into our realm or have we come close to wrongfully transgressing into someone else's realm? Uh, because there will be lying signs and wonders at the time of the footsteps. And we want, if we see false fire, if we see false miracles and wonders, they might actually be a miracle or a wonder, but they're deceiving, they're sorcery. We want to call that out very quickly. And we can do it. We can prepare for that. Um, let's just review for a minute here. Um, angelic principles. I'm going to pull a slide up here for you. So if you want to copy this down, you can. This is by no means a full list. Uh, I'm just, I'm not that much into angelology, but if we're going to do this study, we're going to have to know a little bit about how angels work. And so I think this is probably pretty concise. So if you want to copy this down or, or screenshot it or whatever you want to do with it, feel free. Um, so we just got a few bullet points here things to know about angels. And then over the next week or two, we'll try to unpack some examples of how this works. Um, first of all, uh, the most common name for an angel is going to be a malak, malak or malakim in, in the plural. Um, they are messengers typically, and they are sent with a specific message, mission. And I compare it to a deputy serving a warrant. Uh, but because they are so single-minded on these tasks, they have a single realm of authority, a single task to do, scripture will reflect, reflect that. If you go back and you research the interactions between angels and human beings, it's very deliver the message, here's the message, over and out. They don't tie up the line, telling stories. This is what it is. Any questions, see you later, Tater. So they're, they're not going to have unnecessary dialogue. It doesn't mean they're rude. They can appear, appear to be rude sometimes, uh, but they're not. They're just doing what they're wired to do. Uh, it doesn't mean that they won't greet you, you know, that they won't acknowledge who you are. They will. But um, they will deliver the message and be gone. You can see, by the way, people ask an angel's name in scripture that they understood if they could know the angel's name, they would have a better at a better handle on what they came there to do or what their power was. And so typically an angel's name is going to reflect some divine attribute that's going to enable him to complete his task. Like Gabriel, he's the strength of El. Uh, and so if, if we're seeing these angels kind of like deputies, they get their, their decree, they get their message from the throne. And then what do they need to execute this mission? Well, Gabriel, he, in his missions, they will require, require strength. So that's his name, the strength of El. Um, Michael, 
reflects the uniqueness and the oneness and the aloneness of God as the creator, who is like El, nobody. He's incomparable. So in a question of authority, you don't necessarily need the strength of El, but you do need his authority, Michael. So you can see why Gabriel needed Michael to help him break through the Prince of Persia's resistance. Uh, additionally, often they will, sometimes they just appear like human beings, but then it's like when the human being's eyes are open a little bit spiritually, all of a sudden they can perceive a lot of divine glory and honor. Why would they see something like that? Well, it's almost like a badge. A sheriff gives the deputy a badge and he says, okay, you're doing this in my name. Go do what you do in my name. So I'm giving you this badge of honor that people will respect as if it were me. And so some of the divine glory of the Holy One is placed upon this angel. Some of his hood, some of his honor is placed upon this angel to execute the mission. And so that, that extra glory and honor that they're carrying, it in a way it reflects his delegated authority. Uh, but they don't want to be worshipped. If you see that, if all of a sudden you see this intense light from this being, it doesn't mean you worship the being. It's telling you how impossible it would be to look at the light of the one who put that light on that angel. So you never worship the angel. That light is just like his badge. You can look at that light and say, oh, my goodness, this came from the throne. That's a sign of his authority and his obedience to that authority. But we have to be careful because, remember, the deceiver can also appear as an angel of light, and that is not his badge. <laughs> um, or maybe it is. I don't know. We, we could probably debate that because if Esau's angel had to do what he did with Jacob in order to release the legitimate blessing, in the same breath, he is a, he is a deceiver. He is an adversary. He is a Satan. But on the other side, because remember, Satan, there's a big S Satan, but there's also a small S Satan, which is, just means an adversary, somebody who's, who's in your way. It doesn't have to be of a particular entity. It can be the nature of that being. Even a human being can be a Satan, small S, if they're an adversary. Like, um, well, we won't get into synagogue of Satan. That goes in places that, that people typically don't have enough background to understand. Uh, but it typically means uh, somebody who is misapplying the word, someone who's misapplying the word. And so uh, this deceiver can entice you to misapply the word, to find out what's in your heart, to test you. Jacob was being tested. What was in his heart? Faithfulness. He just stood firm and said, bless me. Uh, Angels are created beings, and some of them are appointed to nations, to domains. Some are appointed to population centers or individual human beings. And when later, next week or the next, when we go over Daniel, uh, we'll see how the mission of Gabriel met resistance from the Prince of Persia, and how that can to us seem like it takes a little more time when that happens. But here's why we're doing this, right? Um, we want to make sure that we don't fall prey to the deception of the beast. Even though the beast is given authority to deceive, we don't want to be among those who are deceived because there's no reason to be deceived. If you know the word, um, you just shouldn't be deceived. It, it, you know, your truth should begin with, it is written, not I think I feel I want. If your truth begins with, I think I feel I want, and I get so sick of hearing, well, this is just my truth. Well, of course it's yours, but it's not the holy ones, and it won't resurrect you from the dead. You'll die in your truth. But it is written is the truth. His word is truth. And if we rely on our truth, we can be deceived. 
if we rely on his truth, I don't think there's any danger of being deceived. Uh, it says he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who are in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of the sky to the earth and the presence of people. And he deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast. Don't let a sign or a wonder deceive you. It was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause all who do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Right? So um, we have to be careful because we can be deceived. Um, Intentional rebellion. Sometimes we're just immature. We're ignorant. We don't know what we don't know. That's different. But if we're intentionally rebellious, then eventually he will give you what you want, which is to perceive that which looks to be real, but yet it isn't. Because um, these angels are these Elohim, small e. And they do have assigned authority. It just says authority was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast. It's given to him. He can do it. He can do it. The angel could fight with Jacob all night. He can do it. The only question is how do we react to this authority to the, the they're exercising because we're, we're being warned up front. We're not fighting against flesh and blood principalities and powers in high places. Esau was just the, the physical person, but Jacob went to the source. He went to the real adversary. And when he dealt with the real adversary from the high place, then when he met Esau face to face, it just like it deflated Esau and everything he meant to do on that journey. I'm sure he meant to kill Jacob when he started out the journey. I'm sure he meant to kill Jacob because he'd already said he was going to. But sometime in the night when Jacob prevails over this high place, it all goes out of Esau. And he's like, my brother, good to see you again. And um, he's perfectly willing to take the natural blessings and to let Jacob have the, the long term. Uh, but don't forget these, these beings, they are mighty in power. They are very powerful in spiritual realms, but that power is allotted to them only to carry out their assigned tasks. They don't want to be worshipped, but this is where we get things like idolatry, sorcery, divination, astrology, necromancy, and other dark arts that will cross those boundaries and they will seek out these principalities and powers as a source to tap into rather than tap into the Holy one who will not give them everything they want. See, if you follow him, he says, the, the cost of following me is you'll do my will. But if you want to seek after these principalities and powers, it's so you don't have to do his will. And so they will do your will that you want to tap in. See, it's so funny, like demons tapping into human beings to exercise their will. But in the same way, there are human beings who cross that boundary, who think they can manipulate these principalities and powers to do their will. And so they're both wrong. You cannot cross realms without a divine message, mission, authorization, and so forth. Uh, so when a human being dies, they're assigned to a different realm. They're in a, they're in a realm of death. However, a believer, a righteous person is assigned a place where it really is a continuation of life. The soul continues to exist and there's a consciousness of the soul. 
And there's a separation between the two. Uh, the understanding is the righteous soul goes to the Garden of Eden, given a white robe, just like it says in Revelation, and they function there in that white robe. I call it a space suit because they need something. They need, you know, they need to look like they're taking up some sort of space. They need form to function there until their resurrected body is restored to that soul. The, the wicked, uh, the lukewarm, there's kind of a different holding place. There's another boundary there that we see that in the parable with the rich man and Lazarus. Um, but there are people who try to cross this boundary. They might miss, you know, um, a mom, a dad, a child so much that they're willing to go to a necromancer and have that ne necromancer contact this deceased loved one. And often it will appear that they have done that. Something will appear that will look like the relative or the loved one. It will sound like them. It will even know things the deceased would know. And we don't know exactly how that works. We don't need to. All we need to know is that it is an encroachment into the realm of death. That is not our realm yet. We will be assigned somewhere upon death, but we're not there yet. Um, Yeshua is the only one who earned resurrection for human beings. Only Yeshua earned that right to resurrect a human being. If we were to be given a mission of resurrecting another human being, it would have to be under divine authority. We would need to know that was what the Father wanted us to do. And under what authority? In the name of Yeshua. We, we invoke that name, that authority, because we have no authority to resurrect from the dead apart from him. That's necromancy. And it goes back to giving breath to the image of the beast. That's what a sorcerer, a necromancer is trying to do. They're trying to give breath to that which is dead. And it will appear, if you want to see it, it will look like it's happening. But if you understand, that is an illusion. That is a sorcery. And this person does not have the authority to cross that boundary and, and try to pull up a dead soul. Um, all they're going to be able to do, all a necromancer is going to be able to do is call forth a spirit that has some appearance of the deceased. Right? Only in Yeshua's authority do you call forth a resurrected person to live again. Um, and so that was kind of a long lesson. But I wanted us to have a good foundation so we can really fly next week um, as we get into these principalities and powers and high places and uh, how they work. But more importantly, before we you know, really get into that, we need to acknowledge that there will be people out there who can try to pass themselves off as the prophets, like in the Torah portion this week, uh, false prophet, it's sorcery. Even though it might look like that's really a sign, that's really a wonder, it goes back to what do you want to see? Do you want to be rebellious? Do you want rebellion to be true? Do you want that to be your truth? If so, then it's going to look like he was resurrected. It's going to look like he called down fire. It's going to look like Pharaoh's magicians made serpents. If that's what you want to see, that's what you'll see. But it's, you're, you're being a fool. If you think there's any other way in, any other way in is a thief and a robber. If you're not going through the door of Yeshua's authority, you're a thief and a robber. You're just like the robber. The way the angel appeared as a shepherd robber to Jacob. It's a sorcery. There's no sheep there. Those are Esau's. Um, really, this is all a preparation for us to remember why we were encamped the way that we were encamped in the wilderness. Twelve tribes, uh, sections of three tribes on each side of the four directions of the four winds, 
And what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to be a kingdom of priests. Out there in the wilderness is the prototype. Because remember, you've got the Mishkan, you've got the tabernacle there in the middle. You've got the Levites going around like a little horseshoe. And then in front of the Mishkan, you've got the priesthood. Uh, you've got Moses, Aaron, and their sons. And yeah, they're the Levitical priesthood and the Levites. But who's encamped around them? Who comes into direct contact with the world? The 12 tribes of Israel. They come into contact with the 12, with the, with the four winds. See how they're encamped there with their four banners? They face the four winds. They face the nations of the earth. And as they are ministered to by priests and Levites, so the 12 tribes are priests and Levites to the world itself. And see, that encampment in the wilderness was so they could practice judging, just like it says in Shoftim in our Torah portion this week. They were to practice being good judges righteous judges. So when the nations brought the hard cases up to them, brought them up to the gates of Jerusalem, when they were settled in their territory, when they received their inheritance, that there would be peace on earth. Because you see, as long as these principalities and powers are struggling and fighting against one another, there's no peace. What a responsibility. You say, oh, I don't have any purpose. You know, I'm just a teeny tiny little part of the whole. No, you're huge. Your obedience is huge. Because just imagine what peace you can bring with the rule and the reign of King Messiah when you were encamped and your spot in obedience, looking into the light of the word, looking into the instruction of the Torah. So that if somebody comes to you where you are right now, you're out in the wilderness of the peoples right now. So when people come up to you and they say, I'm having a problem here. Can you help me judge this? Can you help me think through this? You can say, yes, let's go to the word. Let's go straight to the word. What does the word say about this? And you can teach them. You can do exactly what Isaiah said you would do which he described more of this great glory of doing it from Jerusalem, but it starts right here in the nations of our exile. We're in the wilderness of the people. He's a little sanctuary among us. And so we have to protect that little sanctuary. We have to be able to practice judging. You know, the, the dumbest thing I ever hear is judge not that you be not judged. Well, that's a completely different issue. That's being a busybody. But when people come to you for judgment, when they need advice, when they need you to help them look into the word and get clarity, what is sin? What is not sin? How do I do this? How do I apply this commandment? How do I make light out of this commandment in my life? That's your job. You're a judge. You're an Elohim, small e, not big e. You're not the creator. You're the created. But see, when Israel encamps, in the wilderness there, their job was to bring peace to the earth. And they were being prepared so that when they were put in Jerusalem, that the nations could go up and receive righteous judgment. And all these principalities and powers could be brought down. No longer need it. Just irrelevant at that point. I don't know if they'll have other assignments. I'm sure they will. But in terms of the chaos that they're causing right now, the things that we're struggling against right now, that's going to be shaken. It's going to be brought down. But he's not going to bring them down until he's ready to raise us up. So I hope that's an encouragement. It's also a, a big task. You know, if we think about that, that's a big obligation. Are you ready? Are you ready to judge the nations with King Messiah? If King Messiah sends you on a mission, you know, I think that's the beauty of he scattered us out here among the nations. And so we know the language, we know the culture, we know the geography. We know the history. 
We know the things about the nations we need to know in order to be good judges. And so that, that thing that has felt so awful, I'm out here in exile among the nations, it's so hard to keep the tour, it feels like everything is swimming upstream. Well, those things that seem like they were such obstacles, and they are such, ob such obstacles, those very obstacles were, will turn out to make us good judges because we will know the people we're judging. And so not only will we have righteous judgment from the word, we will be able to apply it uniquely to particular nations because not every nation is like the other. And so you practice, you get ready, you prepare to rise up. You practice being a good judge and nobody sits on the bench if they don't know the law. Uh, I, I think that would be, which you don't want to mess with people too much when they're first kind of coming to the idea that the Torah really is still truth. It wasn't left in the dust 2,000 years ago. Instead, it rose up from the dust 2,000 years ago. And just tell them, you know, if, if you were going to court, if you were in trouble and somebody brought you to the court, would you want to stand before a judge who didn't know the law? Of course you wouldn't. Nobody would. Unless you liked breaking the law, then you would probably want a judge that didn't know the law. But we're not going to stand before a judge who doesn't know the Torah. And should he choose us to be one of his judges or, or send us on a mission? If he sends us out of Jerusalem with the word and the Torah, then who, who are we going to go teach? Who are we going to go judge? Who are we going to instruct if we don't know what's in the Torah? So we have to be good judges. Uh, we're not, we're, he's not going to put us on the bench because we win a popularity contest or a beauty contest, you know, or he looks into our bank account and sees how much money we have in the bank account. None of that matters. All measures are equal. He says, are you competent to judge my word? And can I trust you with my people? Because a shepherd must be trusted with the people. And that's what a judge's job is to do. Heal the nations by applying the Torah. The word is healing. He sends his word and heals them. So if he sends you forth with his word as a judge on a mission, then your job is going to be to take his word and heal the nations. He's going to take some of his authority and put it on you to carry it out. Now, I don't know what your badge is going to look like. <laughs> Maybe it's that white stone. I don't know. Um, but we know that, that he will put some of his glory upon us. And it may be that just the glory that's already in there, that's hard to see because our body's not resurrected. Maybe that resurrected body will just radiate with all the light we've been accumulating. But I know some of you uh, run into you at conferences and, and different places. I know some of you that even your physical body is not concealing your light because it's just radiating. The joy of Adonai and his word is just radiating out of you. So you get out there this week and you radiate. Okay? Is it a deal? Radiate his word. All right. I'm going to let you go. Uh, we've had a long lesson and I am thirsty, thirsty, thirsty. And uh, might take a little recliner nap if it comes down to it. And I hope you, you've had a chance to get a nap today and get recharged and ready to charge into the next week as we're getting ready for the high holy days. And we're, we're going up, guys. We're going up from here, right? We made it through the straits. We're going up from here. So Bezrat Hashan, I'll see you next week. And we'll, we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts here in these principalities in power. Okay? Love you. And we'll see you next week. Bezrat Hashan.